call to order the Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment Stakeholder Workgroup. And we'll begin by asking Anna to call roll, please. Yes, sir. Justin Wilson. Present. I'm sorry, sir. Can you say that again? Uh, present. Thank you. Uh, Denise uh, Cosarelli. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Cosarelli. Present. Thank you. Francesca Wall. Present. Lindsay Stiegel. Present. George Johnson. Present. Brian Moran. Present. Josh Tynert is absent. Robert Pitzel. Present. David Donahue. Sir, you're muted. Let us show that David Donahue is here. He's just muted. Uh, Tyler Nicholson in place of Mariah Benson. Present. Michael Chamberlain. Hello, Peter. Jamie Mitchell. Present. And Mike Wisco. Present. And presenting officer Steve Bruno. I'm present. You've got a quorum. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Steve Bruno. I'm Deputy Executive Director here at the Department of Licensing and Regulation, serving as provided, presiding officer of this work group. I want to begin by thanking everyone for being here today. Um, thank you for joining us online and thank you for joining us in person. We're here because last session, um, a few bills passed and we'll get into the specifics about those regarding electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, our agency has been tasked with regulating those charging stations. And the purpose of this work group is to help us um, develop rules. Uh, our main goal is to have rules drafted by the end of this year, specifically by, excuse me, rules adopted by our commission uh, by the end of this year, by December 1st of 2024. This is a new, uh, new area of regulation for us and for the state. So that's one of the reasons that we're so excited that everyone's here joining us to provide your input and expertise. We'll get into some of the specifics about this process in a little bit, but I did want to give a brief overview of our agency. The Department of Licensing and Regulation was originally, uh, in its original iteration, founded in 1909. Um, we've been around for a while, and our core foundation is in Chapter 51 of the Occupations Code. Chapter 51 outlines uh, our department and our commission. Like many agencies, uh, we are governed by a seven-member commission. Those members are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Texas Senate. And those are the members who ultimately will be adopting the rules that are proposed by this group. Um, right now, we regulate a total of 38 programs. And those programs are spread across, across six different codes um, in, in our Texas statutes. Um, specifically, the one we're talking about here uh, um, is Chapter 2311 of the Occupations Code. It's a new chapter, um, and again, we'll get into the, to the bills later, um, that was created last session by the legislature. When you add up the people and the businesses and the equipment that we regulate, that equipment includes elevators and escalators, boilers, um, gas pumps, there are over 1 million licensees um, overseen by our agency. As I stated earlier, uh, our main purpose here is to propose and adopt rules, uh, have our commission adopt rules by the end of this year, by December 1st. Those will lay the foundation for the beginnings of the regulation of these charging stations here in Texas. I'd like to have each work group member go around um, on it since we're spread out virtually and, and in person i'll ask you to call on work group members and if you'll each give a brief introduction um, about yourself and a little bit about your background of course justin wilson uh good, good morning uh just an audio check can you hear me in the room yes we can sounds good thanks perfect. justin uh, perfect thank you um uh, Justin Wilson, I am a senior director 
um, of utility partnerships and regulatory affairs at ChargePoint. Uh, for those who don't know ChargePoint, we are a manufacturer um, of um, EVSC hardware and software. Uh, our primary business model is selling that hardware and software to independent owners and operators of charging stations. Those could be electric utilities, fueling and convenience providers, hotels, um, restaurants, anyone who would like to install electric vehicle charging stations, we seek to provide them both with those hardware and software solutions. Uh, I've been at ChargePoint for about five years, uh, focusing on market development, regulations, and legislation. Uh, excited to be part of this uh, working group and really appreciate um, the state of Texas taking a foundational approach, uh, looking at this fresh and uh, and and hopefully uh, providing regulations that work for the industry, work for consumers, and work for the state regulators. Denise Cazzarelli. Good morning. So I'm, my name is Denise Kozdrali. I work with Dover Fueling Solutions. Uh, I am the re regulatory engineer here, and I will be, uh, I've had about 12 years as regulatory at NRTLs, uh, or NERDLs, or however y'all want to call them, uh, and just started working here at Dover. Francesca Wall. Good morning, everyone. My name is Francesca Wall. I manage EV charging public policy at Tesla in North America. Um, so I lead all of our regulatory engagement on a number of different topics across the US, including um, the regulation on the weights and measures side, um, and have been heavily engaged with um, state level policy on that, as well as um, throughout the National Conference on Weights and Measures. Uh, I've been with Tesla for almost nine years. Um, and um, as you all know, Tesla is sort of bringing the views of both a manufacturer of EVs in the great state of Texas, um, as well as a provider of EV charging infrastructure. Um, we have just over 22,000 fast chargers in the US now, um, and a significant portion of those are located in Texas. So looking forward to um, being part of this working group um, and the implementation of um, some standards around charging infrastructure. Yeah. Lindsay Stiegel. Good morning, I'm Lindsay Stiegel. I'm a senior manager of market development and public policy at EVgo, uh, where I manage our policy and regulatory engagement across um, central and eastern US. Uh, if you don't know, EVgo sorry. owns and operates one of the nation's largest public fast charging networks. Uh, I've been here around two and a half years now, and prior to that, I was at the Colorado Energy Office, where I managed policy and regulatory affairs related to a wide range of clean energy topics. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of the group and look forward to the collaboration. Brian Moran. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Moran. I'm Director of Government Affairs for Racetrack. And uh, we look forward to uh, contributing to the collective wisdom in the room and, and, and virtually on uh, developing set of rules for EV charging and consumer protection. Um, by way of background, I'm a former regulator, consultant, as well as uh, you know, director of public affairs at Racetrack. And uh, you know, have a lot of experience in the industry as well to bring to bear. David Donahue. I believe Mr. Donahue is having some technical issues with his mic. So if you can uh, get that fixed, sir, uh, we'll come back to you. Robert Pitzel. Yeah, mic check. We can hear you, sir. Awesome, Robert Pitzel. I'm a staff engineer at Centerpoint Energy, the electric utility in Houston, Texas. Been here for going on nine years now, working our high voltage metering group, but we also obviously do some different metering applications across our system. I'm excited to be here. Michael Chamberlain. Good morning, my name is Michael Chamberlain. I'm the Director of Data Management in the Transportation Planning and Programming Division at TxDOT. I've uh, been here 23 years. Uh, we maintain a virtual network of all the highways in Texas and the attributes that go along with those highways. I'm also the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program Manager uh, for Texas. 
George Johnson. Hi, my name is George Johnson. I, uh, I'm at M&A Mercedes, building out the Mercedes charging network. Most of that is in Texas right now. I started in this industry back in 2010, building out the EVgo uh, Freedom Station network in Texas, and then moved to California, and then became the VP of Americas for Shell Recharge before I recently moved over to build this network. So I'm, a, I'm boots on the ground. I bring the perspective of what it takes to build these things. Tyler Nicholson. Uh, yeah, my name is Tyler Nicholson. I'm filling in for the PUC today as a backup, but I will be following this as I follow the EV chargers uh, for Nehruk. I am an economist in markets analysis, usually doing generation side of the ERCOT market. Jamie Mitchell. Good morning, Jamie Mitchell with Austin Energy. We're the city's locally owned uh, municipal mm -hmm. utility here in Austin, Texas. And we've been promoting electric vehicles since before they were actually commercially available. Started in 2007 with the plug-in partners program, promoting uh, plug-in hybrids before they were actually uh, built. Drove around ones that we'd had modified with, with various degrees of success. And we're really excited to see where everything is going. We're working with uh, the partners in the charging community and everyone else as we uh, develop this out. Really appreciate it. TDLR and Brian setting this up, and here we go. Thank you so much for having us. And Mike Wisco. Good morning, Mike Wisco. I'm the agency chief for the Texas Commission on Fire Protection. We regulate the uh, career firefighters and fire departments across the state of Texas. Uh, I've got about 36 years of experience in fire and EMS, and uh, for the last four, I've been here with the state on the regulatory side. Happy to be here. Looking forward to this. Thank you, everyone. Next, we'll go to our executive office. Mr. Francis. Good morning. I'm Brian Francis, the acting uh, executive director for TDLR. Uh, just a little background. I was the executive director for a couple of years. Um, I retired back uh, in 2022, and uh, I just couldn't resist coming back. So I'm excited to be back here with the agency. I love the folks here, and I love the mission. Uh, for what we do. Thank you all for uh, signing up for this. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to increase your salaries. <laughs> and I'm going to multiply it times two. So uh, that zero times two, you know, I want to leave a mark on what we do here. Um, I'm excited about this opportunity. And somebody on the board said it. It's about building this thing from the ground up. Y'all, we have the opportunity to really uh, put that first class uh, EV charging system, station system in place nationwide. I want us to have the best. My team knows that I'm always talking about, I want to be the best. Um, there have been other states that have had successes and failures. We have an opportunity to look at those and build on top of those. We don't have to start from scratch in terms of that. So uh, I think when you heard the diversity of perspectives that are available for us, uh, that is exciting to me. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Tuckman's uh, rules for team development, uh, but Tuckman has four stages, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, when you have this diverse perspectives, y'all, we're going to storm, and it's natural. We're, we're, we're going to try to figure out, you know, how do we uh, articulate our position and make sure it gets heard. Uh, that's the storming part of it. But when we get our feet underneath us and we start norming this process and really bringing in what Tesla has to talk about and, and charge point and the Mercedes folks up here and the engineer, I don't think I've ever heard of a regulatory engineer. I love that. Um, when we start getting those perspectives all huddling around the same idea, man, we've got an opportunity to really build something special. So I want you to lean into it. But when there is a perspective that said you don't agree with, lean into that thing and, and, and put your position on, out there as well. Let, let's look at it. Let them create a little friction together. And at the end of the day, as diverse as our perspectives are, we got one goal. We want this thing to work for Texas and Texas. We want it to be fair. We want it to be reasonable. We want it to be less burden for everybody involved. 
So if we can do it in 1,000 words, <laughs> let's do it in 1,000 words. Uh, we don't have to do 10,000 words. I'm going to look down at my attorney right now. We don't have to do 10,000 words. Let's make it smart, lean, and reasonable as we move forward with this. So uh, as you can tell, I'm excited to be back, but I'm more excited to be a part of this process. Roll up your sleeves, be a part, hang in there, uh, and, and bring your perspective to the table. That's what's going to make this thing work and be valuable. We have till when, um, Presiding Officer Bruno? Uh, the statutes provide that rules will be adopted by December 1st of this year. We've got our time, but let's keep a sense of urgency. Let's don't take advantage and have this complacency that kicks in because, oh, we've got 12 months. Let's keep some urgency, but y'all, we have our time to make this thing work for us and sing for us. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think I've got to um, turn over the rest of my time to the presiding officer. It's kind of weird when... Your employee is now your boss in the meeting, but okay. <laughs> right. well, welcome to government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and your uh, your comments on our timeline are very appropriate because now we're going to be hearing next from Mr. Mark Gladney. Mark is um, an assistant general counsel um, with our agency who I've had the privilege of working with on several programs. You know, Mark does outstanding work. Um, and while the timeline does sound long, uh, we're about to find out that it's really not. Um, Mark's going to help us go through a couple of important statutes. Um, and then um, the rest of this part of the, uh, of the agenda, item C, we'll be hearing from other members of TDOR um, and hearing about their roles and responsibilities. And then we'll come back to Mark to get into some of the meat of why we're all here with the two bills that were um, tasked with developing rules for. So, Mark, I'll turn it over to you, sir. All right. Uh, for the record, uh, again, my name is Mark Gladney. I'm Assistant General Counsel here at uh, TDLR and, and very happy to be uh, a part of this program uh, as I, I bought an EV myself about a year ago. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, in you know, what we're going to be doing here and, and, and where we're going to be going for you know, certainly some personal reasons, but but also for the the benefit of um, you know all the uh, interested parties, the stakeholders, and and Texas consumers. So, um, as um, um, Presiding Officer Bruto noted, today's meeting is an introduction to the TDLR, and 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 I'm going to give you a, a brief overview as to how the uh, rulemaking process is going to work, uh, and and uh, in conjunction with your participation in the, the EV program. Uh, both for the uh, the work group members and the interested parties and the general public who happen to be tuning in uh, right now, um, we're obviously we're opening up a, a brand new chapter in, in Texas transportation regulations, and uh, we need everyone's expertise expertise and participation in this process. Uh, when when I was doing my research to, to buy my electric vehicle, uh, I thought I did a lot of research and I thought I knew a lot of stuff, but. Uh, compared to you know the people that we have on this work group and and, and other interested parties, I realized that I couldn't fill a thimble with what uh, I know compared to you. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited about this. So uh, we have a limited amount of time today on our agenda. So you know if I, I I know that some work group members are going to want to you know make make comments later on uh, during the, the course of this meeting. If you do that, we ask that you keep your, your comments uh, short, probably no more than, than three minutes, uh, and so we can we can get through everything that we need to get through uh, during this particular meeting. Uh, and we recognize here at TDLR that everyone has got uh, unique viewpoints and, and brings expertise to the table, and uh, TDLR has traditionally used the expertise in, of uh, whether it's a work group or it's an advisory board um, that we have to help us craft um, reasonable and, and superior rules. So, you know, we're depending upon you uh, to, to, to lend us your, your expertise so that we can create the, the best set of rules that we possibly can for this program. Uh, no, no stone's gonna be left un, unturned here. Um, you know, we're, we're starting out today with the work group, but later on you're gonna find that we're gonna break the work group into two committees and those committees are going to be dedicated to certain aspects related to SB 1001 and, and SB 1732. 
Yeah, and um, those uh, committees are going to break off into the various meetings and are going to meet with uh, staff and we're going to work on these rules and uh, and then come back to uh, work group meetings and give reports to the work group as uh, what what our progress is and where we are in the rules. You know, so all this is going to be um, uh, open to the the public, open to the entire work group. You're going to know uh, everything that we're we're pretty much everything that we're we're doing. Uh, again, the purpose here is to come up with the best set of rules that we possibly can for you know, the uh, the stakeholders and Texas consumers. So, um, I'm going to start here with this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about the, the Administrative Procedures Act and the Public Information Act. If you were a standard advisory group, we we would be, we would talking also about the Open Meetings Act, but uh, this particular work group doesn't necessarily fall under 551 of the government code. So the Open Meetings Act doesn't totally um, apply in this particular situation, but we are still going to treat it um, pretty much that way. So, and then the purpose for that is to make sure the public knows exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So we will be having public uh, meetings for the work group uh, meetings. And, and we will also be publicly uh, uh, publishing the agendas for those work group meetings, just like we did for today. So we'll be doing that for future uh, meetings. There's no telling how many future work group meetings we're going to have. I, I know we're going to have more than just this one. You know? um, so, um, you know, uh, the committee meetings, I, I suspect that there's going to be quite a few of those. You know? So uh, you'll, you'll know probably when we know. Okay. All righty. So, um, going on to the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, the purpose of the act is to establish minimum standards of uniform practice and procedure for state agencies and to provide public um, participation and transparency throughout the, the, the rulemaking process. And you're going to hear the word transparency over and over and over again because the public is really going to want to know what it is that we're doing here. And, and we have the duty to make sure that uh, they have the opportunity to uh, know what we're doing and to participate fully. Okay. So uh, the um, APA definition of a rule is basically, it's just simply a, a statement of general applicability that uh, made by a state agency that implements or interprets law or policy or describes a procedure or practice requirements of a state agency. So. Basically, a rule explains a, what a statute means. You know, sometimes we'll have statutes that clearly you, you, you know, anybody can read it and, and know exactly what the legislature is talking about. Sometimes the legislature gets a, either a little bit cloudy in what it is they're saying in, in a statute, or they, they give the, the, um, the agency a lot of wide latitude to interpret what the statute means. And if you take a good look at SB 1001, you're going to find a lot of provisions in SB 1001. It's, it simply says, well, the commission might rule, may, you know, do this, you know, do X, you know, or say the commission uh, by rule must do X, you know, but it doesn't necessarily lay out. It just lays out an objective as, as to what the statute wants to have done. It's going to be our job. Uh, as a work group and as uh, department staff to interpret what the, 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 the legislature meant by that. And that's why rules are written. They're written to fill in the blanks. Okay. So, uh, next slide. So, uh, a rule excludes any statement regarding only the internal management or, or organization of a state agency that doesn't affect uh, private rights or procedures. Uh, a rule includes a new rule or if we amend an existing rule or we repeal an existing rule. In this case, we're creating a brand new um, chapter. Uh, I think we've already assigned it chapter 96 in the Texas Administrative Code. So there won't be any amending of existing rules or repealing of existing rules. This is all new stuff. Okay. So uh, where, do we, where do we get our sources for rulemaking? Uh, we can get our sources from uh, obviously bills, uh, advisory boards, uh, department staff. Uh, we're required to do a four-year rule review of existing uh, rule chapters. Uh, we can get ideas from, from that. Uh, if somebody uh, sends us a uh, files a petition for rulemaking, 
Uh, we can get ideas for rulemaking uh, through those petitions. And lastly, what we have here, stakeholder group groups. Uh, and we're going to get a lot of ideas from y'all as to how to write these rules. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, a rule petition can be uh, um, filed by a, uh, any interested person requesting the adoption of a rule provision. Uh, and an interested person can be a Texas resident, a business entity in Texas, uh, governmental subdivision, uh, or public or private organizations uh, located in Texas. Okay. All right. Now, this is what the rulemaking process is going to look like. Um, uh, basically, a rule starts out with an idea, and then we start drafting a rule based on that idea. And then, of course, these ideas we are hoping are going to come from the work group and from the general public and from interested parties. Uh, we, we certainly will be taking written public comments uh, from folks. So if you have some ideas on rules, you can start filing them now, you know, and, and we'll certainly take a look at every single one that uh, we get. And we expect that we're going to get a lot, you know. So um, uh, this can be done before we get to the publication and 30-day comment period. Um, so we start with a, a rule idea. And then staff uh, and this work group will go through internal review through the committees uh, and, um, and, then, and then analyze those things and, and start writing rules. Uh, once we get uh, a rule package written, then we submit it to the governor's office and the governor's office will review it. And then we have to have their approval prior to uh, sending it up for publication. Okay. Um, now, once we get the approval from the governor's office, then we will take those proposed rules and we will file them and they will be published in Texas register registers for the whole world to see. Um, and then there'll be a 30 day public comment period where anybody can file written, written comments uh, about what they like about the rules, what they don't like about the rules, uh, anything that's germane to the, the, the rules that have been published. Um, and and we again we expect to get a whole bunch of comments on on this because this is extremely important. Uh, once the thirty day comment period uh, ends, then um, staff will start uh, reviewing the public comments, and and we will start uh, providing responses to those public comments. Um, you know whether it's uh, um, within uh, the, the comments within the scope of the rule, uh, and and the request for the change with the scope of the rule. Maybe it isn't, then our response would be, well, it's not within the scope, you know, uh, or it might be a, a suggestion that comes in when we say, hey, that's a great idea. We want to do that, you know, so uh, we'll make that change. Huh? Mark, are the comments to the, uh, or the response to the comments that come in, are you writing that back directly to the person who made the comments, or is there a, a, a general response or process that's available? Uh, the the responses will be formally written in a uh, the the adoption preamble yeah you know? so uh, it, it will be basically in the form of a department or, or commission response to the um, uh, to the comment itself so uh, we won't be writing back to the folks you know so we get some folks you know you know from wherever you know wanting to write us something we won't be formally writing them a response letter it'll just be it'll be part of the the preamble uh, of the uh, the rule package, and the preamble basically just explains uh, what the rule provisions mean. So, so that uh, if there's any kind of question as to when we when we get these rules adopted, if there's any particular question as to well, what does this particular rule mean, and what were they thinking at that time, the information will be right there in the preamble as to why this particular rule was drafted that particular way. Okay. Um, so, once um, we finish with that review, then the proposed rules will go before the commission uh, for uh, a request for adoption. Uh, what we're aiming for right now is October 10th, uh, the commission meeting. So, the, while, the, while the bill says December 1st uh, of this year is the, the deadline, and that's true, that is the deadline, but we may not have a commission meeting uh, before December outside of October 10. So our, our time period is actually a lot shorter um, than that. Because when you start looking at this um, uh, rulemaking process, 
Um, we're starting right now. Here it is, January 9th. Uh, we're going to break into committees to start working on this. Uh, we basically are going to need to have these rules completed to go to the governor's office, probably no later than June, early July. Yeah. So we're basically talking about five or six months of worth of time, uh, and it's going to buzz by really quick. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have to, you know, really put the, the nose to the grindstone and start working, you know, right now. Okay. Um, I can tell you that that staff has already started working on uh, some draft rules, providing some of the the, the framework uh, of what the, the the rules look like. You know, kind of putting it in TDLR style, you know, um, basing it on some similar programs that we have. So um, there there there's already been work that's being done. You know, we we couldn't just sit on and wait for you know, us to get a work group going. So we're we're a little bit ahead of the game, but I can tell you what. Yeah, you know, they're going to catch up with us really quick. Okay, so after the proposed rules are adopted, uh, the adoption notice is filed and published in the Texas Register. Again, letting the whole world know that we should, that the commission just adopted these rules, and they're going to have an effective date. And usually, the effective date is about 15 days after the uh, uh, public publication of the uh, adoption notice. So, um, you know, again. We, we have to have these rules uh, adopted by December 1st. Most likely, they'll probably go into effect on January 1st of 2025. So that's kind of where we are with uh, the rulemaking process. So uh, next slide, please. If anybody happens to be curious about the, the APA, you know, some of y'all might really want to do some homework <laughs> and, and learn about the Administrative Procedures Act, you can find it uh, in... Um, Chapter 2001 uh, of the government code that relates to rulemaking. And uh, the Texas Attorney General has got a great handbook on, on the, uh, the APA uh, for those folks who are really interested in uh, uh, the APA. And again, if you have any questions, you can call the number uh, of the General Counsel's Office uh, on the screen. Uh, for those of you who can't see at bar, 512-463-3306. It may also be in your briefing uh, materials for the work group. Okay. So we're moving on to the Public Information Act. And uh, the Public Information Act is also known as the Open Records Act. Uh, I like to call it the Open Records Act because I'm kind of old, so I'm used to that. Uh, the the uh, PIA is intended to allow public access to information about the affairs of government and the official acts of public officials and employees. Uh, so the act makes all documents, records, and other information relating to the official business of the group uh, open to the public with certain, some exceptions. Uh, public information includes any electronic communication created, transmitted, received, or maintained, and this is important, on any device if it is in connection with official agency business. So if y'all use your personal devices to do work related to, to this, that can be subject to a, an open records request. So you might want to think twice about whether or not you're using personal devices um, for that particular purpose. You know, we might get an open records request from somebody out there. And if we do, we will certainly be forwarding it to the members of the work group, letting them know, hey, this is what we got. Got anything? You need to forward it to us. You know? So um, the act is liberally construed in favor of granting requests for information. Why? Because it's that word again, transparency. The public needs to know what it is that we're up to. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is what the process is. If we get an open records request, if you happen to receive, any of the members of the work group happen to receive a written request for records or correspondence that looks like an open records request, Please forward it to board support, and, and they will forward it to the general counsel's office for the section uh, uh, for open, open records, and they will take a look at it. Do it as quickly as possible because we have a limited amount of time to respond to open records requests, 10 business days. Okay. Uh, the, the department can't ask why somebody wants the records. We can only ask for clarifications. You know? So, uh, again, just be careful about using your your. Uh, private devices for the work that you do as a work group member. And if you do happen to get a request, please respond to it promptly. Okay. 
All right. And uh, as I said, that there are some exceptions to disclosure uh, for open records. Uh, again, the general rule is provide the information. Uh, but there are some um, exceptions and, and certain information would, would be redacted from uh, the request for an open records request, you know, so like date of birth, you know, most email addresses, certainly medical information, uh, driver's license, license to play, credit card numbers, things of that nature. So uh, these are probably things that you may not necessarily need to be worried about. But I'm telling you, just in case we do get um, uh, some requests, because again, this is a very important project that we're embarking upon, and lots of people are uh, have opinions on uh, EVSE, uh, both pro and con, you know, and and that can drive people to, to to do open record requests for all sorts of things. So just be aware. Okay? And that's pretty much about it. If you have uh, again any interest in the Open Records Act, um, again the Attorney General has a great. Um, uh, source of information for it. We provide you with the hyperlinks. And uh, if you want to take a look at the, the PIA, it's in the uh, government code section 552. Okay. Any questions that you might have related to it, just contact the general counsel's office and we'd be more than happy to help you. Okay. And that's pretty much all I have right now. Thank you very much, Mark. Do any work group members, either in the room or virtually, have any questions or comments for Mark from that presentation? All right, excellent. Next, I'm gonna ask Jessica Hurtado from our enforcement division to come and talk about um, the other part of our title. We're the Department of Licensing and Regulation. And regulation is where enforcement comes in. Jessica's gonna give us a quick overview um, of the enforcement process and, and how that works. And talk a little bit about how, um, as part of this rulemaking process, we'll eventually be adopting an enforcement plan. Thank you. Please go ahead, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Hurtado. Uh, senior, I'm a senior prosecutor in the Enforcement Division. I've been with TDLR for a little over six years now. And, um, on, and I'm just going to give you an overview of what we do in enforcement. Um, so on this first slide, you'll see just a little breakdown of how our division is organized. And we are set up in a similar way to how a district attorney's office would be set up. Now, we don't obviously prosecute criminal offenses. We prosecute administrative offenses. But um, it's similar in that we have an intake section that's going to review all the complaints coming in and determine whether this is a complaint we have jurisdiction over or not. If it's not, they're going to send it you know, to the appropriate place if that's where it needs to go. If it is within our jurisdiction, then they're going to open up that case and they're going to sign it to one of our investigators. And we have investigators that are located here locally in Austin and also throughout the state. That investigator is going to gather the documents and the evidence and um, interview the relevant parties. And then they're going to write a report about that case. And that report is going to go to one of our attorneys, one of our prosecutors, who's going to review that case, all the evidence, and make a determination as to what should be the outcome. And you'll also see that we have a, a staff of legal assistants that are assigned to our prosecutors, and they do an amazing job and valuable work keeping us um, attorneys in line. <laughs> the next uh, slide you'll see is just a little overview of the sources of where our complaints can come from. Um, the first source is that we do have another division, Field Inspections, that conducts routine inspections on some of our licensee populations. And when they find violations that are serious enough, um, those violations will be referred to enforcement and prosecuted um, as a result of that periodic or risk-based inspection. The second category, we have our consumer complaints. Anybody in the state of Texas or um, can go onto our website, fill out a form, and make a complaint about one of our regulated industries. And that's where the vast majority of our cases come from. And finally, the last grouping is uh, criminal history cases. So every applicant or renewal, if you're renewing your license or you're applying for the first time, you get a criminal history background check run. And um, 
As I'll explain in just a minute, there are guidelines which we use to look at that background and determine whether you are suited for the license that you're seeking based on that criminal history. So how do we do this? Um, there's a couple of things that we have in place that help us um, in our goal of being consistent across our various programs, our various statutes and rules, and the various teams of attorneys in, that we have. First of all, we have a complaint resolution procedures manual. This is our uh, guiding document that tells us how are we going to um, process a case from the very beginning of intake all the way through to closing. Um, we also have an enforcement plan, and the enforcement plan is developed along with the each program's advisory board to determine what are the violations of either the statute or the rules um, and the seriousness of each violation. So we have categories. They begin with a category A, which are deemed to be the least serious, and they can go up to um, a category D, which are the most serious. And that enforcement plan will also include a penalty range. And so um, as you go up in seriousness, the penalties or the license sanction potentially becomes more serious. And that's based on um, our work with the advisory board as to what is important in the industry, what are the serious violations that we need to be concerned about. And finally, the criminal conviction guidelines. Um, as I said, these guidelines, again, are adopted for each program. There's they're individualized, and they're based on the crimes that are going to be a concern for that program. For example, electricians who go into people's homes, we would be concerned about assaultive offenses. Um, we're not so concerned about electricians who have DWI offenses. It's not really directly related to being an electrician. Tow truck operators we would be very concerned about having a DWI offense because they're driving a very large tow truck on the public highway that's posing a risk to public safety. Just an example of how those guidelines can operate. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is just a little overview of the life cycle of a case. Um, in this case, a consumer case gets filed with the department. Um, as I said, intake will review the complaint to make sure we have jurisdiction and then assigns it to an investigator. The investigator is gonna conduct an investigation and um, that will include any kind of expert review that may be needed. Um, we have some in-house experts that we use or um, we also contract with experts in some of our health professions um, when we're talking about a standard of care issue that we need an expert to weigh in on. And then finally, the case will be assigned to the attorney and their legal assistant. <clears throat> and then how, does the, how do these cases get resolved? Um, the first option is that case can be closed. That can be closed because there's simply insufficient evidence of a violation. After the investigation has occurred, um, the attorney looks at the file and says, I can't prove that the respondent violated a law or rule that we regulate. Um, the case could be closed as a warning. Uh, we issue warning letters that are basically saying, um, while we feel that you violated the law, it's at this point for what for various reasons, um, we're just going to give you a warning. We're not going to pursue any actual penalty. And then finally, we may close the case because it was informally resolved. Um, this often happens when the parties um, work out some sort of um, restitution or refund that makes the complainant whole and the case is resolved that way. Now, if a case isn't closed, the other option is that it can go to an agreed order. So when the attorney reviews the case and they decide that there is a violation there that's significant enough to warrant a penalty, the prosecutor will send what's called a notice of alleged violation. And with that, there will be a settlement offer. And um, the respondent can accept that settlement or we can enter into negotiations. But um, if the respondent agrees and we come to an agreement, we'll have an agreed order that is then signed by our executive director. Um, 
or the other option is a default. So if we send the notice of alleged violation and we never hear back from the respondent, we send a notice of default that says, hey, we haven't heard from you, we need you to respond and we still get nothing, then we'll go ahead and proceed with a default order. And then finally, the last option is that the respondent, when they get that notice of alleged violation, if they don't wanna settle or if we can't come to a resolution, they can request the hearing at the State Office of Administrative Hearings. And um, those hearings are held by another state agency with, who um, employ administrative law judges. Those judges make, uh, will have a hearing and then we'll make a proposal for decision. And that proposal will come back to our full commission for the final decision. Next slide. And so um, basically I wanna end by saying that we need your help um, because we need your input in deciding um, that enforcement plan, what violations are going to be um, the most serious and which are not, and we need your help in those criminal conviction guidelines to know what are the offenses that are going to be concerned for this licensee population. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Jessica, let me um, ask you to give us a, a bit of a timeline on the enforcement plan and the criminal conviction guidelines. Traditionally, when we have a new program like this one, we'll begin with the rules, which this work group is going to give input on. And then can you sort of talk about how, when, when that enforcement part comes into that? Sure. Um, Thank you. So the enforcement plan, we can't write that until we have the rules in place, right? Because we need to know what the rules are to know what the violations are going to be. So the enforcement plan and the criminal conviction guidelines, those are going to follow on after we have um, the rules. Now, once we have a pretty good draft, we internally will probably start writing that enforcement plan, but it will come after. And then the enforcement plan, similar to the rules, though, is ultimately adopted by our commission. Is that correct? Yes. The, the commission will sign off on the enforcement plan and the criminal conviction guidelines. And as Mark explained earlier, that process, like our entire rulemaking process, is conducted in open in public at a publicly posted commission meeting. Yes. Do any work group members have any questions or comments for Jessica? I have a real quick question. Sure. About, uh, motor fuel pumps, about how many, uh, I hate to call them prosecutions, but do you all have them? On the motor fuels? I wouldn't know that off, off the top of my head. Thank you. Yeah. We can probably get some information. Oh, that's going. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. We can have somebody address that when they come up. And then I'll also just note that um, if anyone visits our, our homepage, tdlr.texas.gov, there's a list of each program. And part of, uh, under each program, you will see an enforcement tab. And that's going to show statistical data um, on each program for the uh, number of cases, prosecutions, penalties collected, et cetera. Thank you. Yes, Steve Chair. Oh, did you find the data already? Um, no, I, mean, I, I was just going to make a comment. Can we, can we do that offline uh, since this sure. meeting is, is about... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, absolutely. No, no. And, and Jamie, I've got the information, so I'll give it to you on the first break. All right, just, they're, they're very similar in my mind. If our presiding officer allows us to take a break. <laughs> No, sure. yeah, we'll, certainly, we'll certainly get to that, Mr. Executive Director. <laughs> and my boss. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next, I'm going to ask Laura Hernandez from our licensing division to come up and give an overview of licensing. Um, obviously, that's going to be a big part of the rulemaking is um, the licensing and, and registration of, of these devices. Um, Laura? Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Laura Hernandez. I'm a manager in the licensing uh, division. Um, as uh, Steve Bruno indicated, we have over a, hundred, a million licenses, registration, certifications that we handle applications, renewals, uh, review, and in that includes individuals, businesses, facilities, and equipment. Um, there are over 37 license programs that we issue those for. And within those programs, there's also license types. For for Example, our electrician program has over 15 different license types. So in those 37 programs, there's several that we um, process those applications and renewals. Um, over the years, we've uh, 
TDLR has taken on, has handled many existing programs transfers to TDLR as well as the implementations of new programs. Um, we have three different licensing uh, groups, um, teams that handle the different programs. Accordingly, some will be specialties, such as we have a health professions team, and uh, we have teams with electricians and AC, and then we have kind of my team, which is 14 different teams, <laughs> which goes from licensed breeders to property tax professionals, but we've handled several of those uh, transfers, such as the motor fuel program, the residential service companies, um, as well as the transportation network implementation of that new program, as well as behavior analysts. Um, and so for us, what we're going to do is handle what comes up as far as the applications go, making sure that we get it into a good licensing system where we can capture the information that's needed. Hopefully we can do it online because um, we do have uh, licensing systems where um, a business person can apply online, hoping that we don't have 15 different license types. <laughs> But um, so that's part of our program and working with you all to make sure we can capture that information, make sure those licenses are issued efficiently and capture all the information um, that's needed. Um, that's really all I had. I don't know if there's any questions for the licensing part of it. Yes. Uh, just had one question, you know, particularly with, you know, you've experienced a number of new licensing programs. Mm -hmm. And given that this is a new program, mm -hmm. Do you ever get concerned about implementation issues where, okay, day one, January 1st of 2025, yeah. rules go into effect, but we don't have a population of licensees or licensed individuals to, you know, how, how does that, how do you overcome that? So as an agency, we are very prepared. <laughs> All the divisions work together with compliance division, enforcement division, licensing, general counsel, um, education, if that's a component. We all work together. We, there's a lot of testing. There's a lot of um, looking at our um, forms, um, talking like, what is this industry? Um, compliance is a really good group of gathering the industry together. These work groups, fuel metering quality, we have work groups um, together. What, anticipate what we're going to need, what those needs are, and how can we help overcome that. So I've never been part of one that has not been like, we're ready to go. We're ready for that new application. Even before that day one, we're going to reach out and say, hey, anybody read, um, looking to apply you know, early, kind of give us a test case. Um, and then that way we can roll out, get any of the kinks out and ready to go. Great. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Laura? Excellent. Thank, Thank you. So Next, we're going to be hearing from several members of our compliance division. There are several programs that we regulate at TDLR that either directly or at least tangentially will be touching electric vehicle charging stations. And so we've asked those groups to come up and speak to us today um, about what they do, their roles and responsibilities, and, and how those will relate to this program. We're going to begin by asking uh, our chief electrician, Larry Reichelt, to come up to talk about one of the main programs that's very directly related, our electrical safety program. Um, as a bit of background, um, before the statewide licensing of electricians was implemented here at TDLR, electricians were licensed individually by cities and municipalities. And there was an effort by the legislature um, over 15 years ago I think, um, to consolidate that, to create a statewide license. And with that statewide creation came statewide standards um, and responsibilities so that we can ensure um, the number one goal, ensure safety, right? And so that's obviously gonna be a large component as Mark will, will mention when we get into the meat of the bills, um, the electrician statute is specifically referenced in SB 1001. And so Larry's gonna talk a little bit about that for us. Thank you, Larry. All right. Good morning, work group members. Uh, it's actually been the first legislation bill for the Electrical Safety and Licensing Act was in 2003. So we are right at the 20 year cusp of anniversary on the electrician licensing. Uh, 2004 is when it took effect to be licensed uh, through TDLR for the state of Texas. Uh, my name is Larry Reichel and previously for 17 years, I was the deputy chief electrical inspector for TDLR. So this is not new to me, but as of December, I applied, I was offered and accepted the chief electrical position for TDLR. 
many, most of my years, many of my years, was under Mr. Francis. Welcome back, sir. Good, good to have you. It's good to be back. Um, Electricity is in my DNA. I'm a second generation master electrician. Uh, prior to that, I did uh, United States Navy uh, CB. I was a CB, construction battalion. Uh, came back, started, and then uh, in 2006, accepted the deputy chief electrical position. Uh, I hold the IAEI master electrical inspector certification, one of nine in the state of Texas, and also sit on code making panel 17. 17 deals with uh, swimming pools, appliances, uh, industrial heating, fixed electric space heating, and de-icing equipment, which we don't have much of that here in Texas. <laughs> don't have enough. But also, uh, the National Electric Code has Article 625, which deals with EV charging stations. Uh, as the chief, I'm responsible for the state of Texas in overseeing the electrical program as a subject matter expert for the interpretation of the National Electric Code. Uh, state laws and administrative rules, I also explain that some to the public, the building officials, electrical inspectors, and electricians for the state. Uh, I started with a short uh, point presentation um, for, this, for this first meeting and wanted to point out the meat and potatoes of the Electrical Safety and Licensing Act and how it affects this bill. Uh, while the law has certain exemptions for licensure of electricians, this bill, along with the scope of EV charging stations and the installation of them, do not fall under any. So they will have to follow the National Electric Code, Article 625, and other articles that apply and be an electrical contractor with licensed electricians installing these EV charging stations. I do plan on all of us working diligently together to implement this bill and make sure that the installation of these EV charging stations are installed by the licensed contractors through the state of Texas with licensed electricians for the safety of the public and the technicians who perform service on them. And at this point in time, I, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions or, or comments for our chief electrician? I did that just, good. just more of an observation. I mean, I think this is Please. one of the uh, one of the key areas of EV charging is you know obviously electricity. And do you, you know, I know it's early, but you know, do you see you know any efforts at the national level to try and you know come out with standard codes for EV charging and, and licensing pieces? For national code, as well as the National Electric Code will be for the installation of them. The monitoring of the class one, two, or three limited voltage side, the metering side, that could be a different situation. But as far as the line side of the, and installing the EV chargers, it would have to be done through licensed electricians through TDLR. I do have a question. Please get into this. Is there anything in the national code about emergency shutoffs? in the event of a fire or a problem going on at one of these individual charging stations? There are, just as like at fuel pump stations, it'll be in a different section of the code book. Again, not Article 625 actually points right at the EV charging stations, but there are other sections and chapters and articles of the National Electric Code that have to follow as well. So if, it, if we have an emergency shutoff switch and it is required, then yes, the electrical contractor would have to put that in per the 2023 NEC. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other? All right. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Oh, please. One, one, qu one question. Um, thinking specifically about residential home electric vehicle charging, i just curious in Texas, um, is it standard uh, across, you know, other devices, uh, thinking uh, electric dryers and things like that to have licensed electricians install those in homes? <clears throat> it, it, we've got some variation across the country and just curious if there's kind of leakage with non-licensed electricians, things like that that we should be thinking about. No, in the state of Texas, um, 
they have to be a licensed electrical contractor with licensed electricians performing that installation in the residential uh, dwellings. There's no, there's no limited license or anything. It's electrical contractor with licensed electricians. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks for that, Justin. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we're going to hear from Todd Forrester. Todd works uh, uh, in a variety of our programs in compliance. The one that I've asked him to talk to you about today, it might sound a little bit strange, but um, as everyone knows, a lot of these uh, charging stations are in parking lots. Um, and we regulate the towing and vehicle storage program. So there is a little bit of a connection between um, connection between these um, charging stations and this program. Um, tangentially, I'm sure that many of you have heard stories and can share stories of um, you'll go to the mall and there'll be an EV charging station parking only and there'll be a non-electric vehicle park there because it's a convenient spot. Um, so Todd's going to talk to us a little bit about the towing program and how that um, is connected to this. Good morning. I'm Todd Forster. I have been with TDLR for 16 years now. I started as an inspector in East Texas. Uh, 2013 moved over here to Austin as the program specialist for towing and vehicle storage facilities. A couple other programs, Auto Parts Recyclers is another one that we could eventually see EV vehicles at. Um, for towing and vehicle storage facilities, as presiding officer Stephen Bruno said, um, there, there could be opportunities for people to tow vehicles that do not belong in EV charging stations. The Texas Occupations Code 2308 is, is specific on the, the uh, notification that the towing company must give to the vehicle owner. And the way the lot is laid out will determine if there's additional signage or notification that should be made to the vehicle owner. If the spaces are, if it's an otherwise uh, unregulated lot and the space is just for the EV vehicles, um, would need to have markings, or if it's otherwise regulated, but those spaces are further regulated to only include EV vehicles. It, it's very specific on how it, how it must be marked um, and the notifications that must be made to the vehicle owner so that they know they can't park there. For vehicle storage facilities, there could be an issue with vehicles that have been damaged um, that are sitting on those lots. We're still in the early stages of this and, and thinking about this, the advisory board for towing and vehicle storage facilities um, ha have a, has us looking into this. Um, it segues nicely into this group and what we're doing to address the concerns of, of Mr. Moran. Um, I So with implementing bills, we have something at TDLR called the Center of Excellence. I'm the co-team lead for that. And we are in charge of overseeing the teams. We created teams and oversee the teams for implementation of all the bills that we have at TDLR. We also have a specific team just for EV vehicles, of which I'm the team lead, but it will be leaning on my colleagues and all these all these great people who are much smarter than I am to help get this done. So are we worried about it? Uh, I am constantly, but I also know that we have great leadership and we have, we have a great um, ability to get this done, and which is what we're trying to do here today. Are there any questions for me? <laughs> uh, you and I are gonna get to know one another really well. I think so. <laughs> I like your hair. We have the same hair. Fire service has a lot of heartburn. <laughs> so uh, I look forward to working with you. Yes, sir. You too. Share, share a little bit about that with us so we can start to think about that. Sure. If you don't um, so towing and storage. Um, if, if these EVs are damaged in a collision, which is most typical, um, they still have the stored energy. The energy is still there. There's no way to shut it off. The way they're designed, uh, a minor vehicle collision could cause damage to that energy transmission system. Um, so they're they're towed somewhere. Uh, historically, and there's not a lot of historical data, but over the last ten years, uh, vehicles damaged, electric vehicles damaged in an accident, are known to burst into flames, and, and basically it's called thermal runaway of one of the individual cells in that battery pack. Um, they have commonly occurred during transportation. They also occur while in storage facilities. And um, so some of the challenges here, are these vehicles, unlike a regular gasoline powered car, they burn at temperatures uh, that exceed 3,500 degrees in many cases. 
Um, it's going to have a massive impact on anything close to it. And the fire service, where we call those exposures, all right, or exposure hazards. So you got a, a vehicle that's that's parked in a parking lot, a parking garage, or in a storage yard. If they're within two or three or four or 10 feet of, of something else, a structure, another vehicle, whatever, uh, that's an exposure hazard. And um, electric vehicles are not going to be extinguished. There's proven data on that already. You have to let them burn out. So uh, our role has suddenly become not firefighters, but exposure protectors, whatever that is. So it's truly unregulated throughout the United States. Uh, we have a, a great deal of concern here in Texas um, in a lot of areas. I mean, uh, concrete, let's talk about a parking garage for a second. And I don't want to top the whole meeting, but a, a, a concrete parking structure has steel and concrete. That steel and concrete breaks down at 1,100 degrees. 3,500 degree fire for any amount of time in that concrete structure presents a hazard. Let's put that same EV in a residential structure, a wood frame house. Uh, serious concerns. We're not going to put the source of the fire out. So our goal is becoming to remove that source from, from those areas it's exposing. So we're going to have a lot of discussion about that, there. probably yeah. online and offline, because yeah. it's some heartburn for all of us. That's great, because I mean, the help would be great. Yeah, and that's part of, you know, those are just some of the questions and some of the issues that our work group will be working on collectively. Mark, were we getting a little far? Uh, no, uh, to, to um, kind of add on to um, your question or your comment, uh, I, I work with Todd with, with on uh, vehicle storage and, and towing. And the, the uh, advisory board associated with that program has brought this up on numerous occasions over, over the past year. And, you know, there, there's talk even from like their, their insurance carriers that possibly something like an immersion tank is going to have to be uh, installed uh, on the premises there to immerse those vehicles in water to try to prevent what you're talking about, about the thermal runaway. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of, concepts out there and there's a there's a even more concern about it and, and as I told Todd before we got started I'm probably not going to be liked by the end of this process but we, <laughs> there's any way at all we'd like to address it here in the state of Texas. And I appreciate it all Great. most I know about fires enough not to get burned. <laughs> most, that's the goal of all of us. <laughs> No, you, you make a great point. I mean, that that's the reason we're here and and you'll recall the words of, of our executive director earlier where um we might not all agree on everything that's brought up here, but collectively, our job is to produce the best rule package. And I'll quote Mark because um, it was an extra big quote. Um, something that's both, both reasonable and superior. Yeah, that's awesome. um, and that's going to take all of us working together. Um, we will certainly agree to disagree on some points. It's not going to be a universal 100% um, agreement, but. Um, I've been working in and around state government since 1995, and I've never seen universal agreement. Um, <laughs> but I certainly have, especially since uh, being with TDLR for 11 years and the various programs we regulate, seen great examples, amazing examples of both reasonableness and superiority um, in our rules and in our programs and, and in the forms that, that the licensing team will be putting together as we tie all this together and, and roll out this new program. Um, this is, you all are, are at the front seat of what a new program looks like. Um, you're here because of your particular expertise um, in this topic, but this is exactly um, the type of stuff that regulatory nerds like myself and my fellow co-workers at TDLR get very excited about. Um, that's why we're here. Yes, sir. Designing officer Bruno, Brian Francis speaking. Uh, board member, Wisco, you bring out some interesting points. I'm sitting here like I've never heard this before. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we've got to keep in mind is, one, like I said, put the information on the table. Let's chew on it. Um, our rules are only going to go so far. I mean, some of the things that you have identified are um, inherent, uh, and they, they are part and parcel of this new experience that we have. And our rules aren't going to, to fix that, but they can look at it, and they, they may be able to peek at it uh, from a different angle, but just having that uh, perspective here in front of us, uh, I think having your fellow work group members understand that we've got an expert in fire safety on our committee, 
they may be picking your brain on some other things outside of this. Um, but I, I look forward to seeing how our rules, um, you know, really address what we are here to address. Make sure they don't creep too far. Um, but just being fair and reasonable. But your your comments were just fascinating to me. It's literally what I'm going to talk to my wife about tonight. <laughs> I'm getting excited. You give me these conversations, buddy. Well, and, and I'll share that the the Texas Fire Service is excited that, that we're represented here. Absolutely, and, it's great to have them because we're we're all concerned about this. And, and so, uh, thanks for stepping. When up. I told them we were invited to be part of this. They they made sure I was on time. <laughs> I, I, I might have one other thing to add, uh, Mark Laddy, for the record. Um, once we adopt the rule package, that's not going to be the end of this. You know? uh, you know, as people have been saying, there's going to be people that like these rules, there's going to be people that dislike these rules. You know? And, and you know, I, I fully expect come 2025, if we may be visiting uh, at the legislature um, some things that maybe the rules didn't address fully or, or something that the rules address and some folks don't like. So these are going to, it's going to be a work in progress, even after we, we adopt these rules. I fully expect that there will be changes in the future. And also remember, we've got, we've got some other deadlines that are going to be hitting in 2028 and 2030 and that kind of stuff. So um, these, these rules are always going to be subject to change because the legislature is going to make change. Great point. Thank you, Mark. Are there any additional questions? Thanks, Todd. Thank you. And let's bring up um, the last from a uh, group from our compliance division. We've got Marsha Godot and Tim Foskey. I'm um, going to focus on architectural barriers. And then Tim also works with our motor fuel program. So he'll be able to talk about that as well. And I'll begin with you, Marsha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marsha Godot, and I am the program supervisor of the Elimination of Architectural Barriers program. I come from an architecture background, but I've been working for TDLR for 15 years. So I'm the young one. Uh, but, <laughs> just wanted to put that out, you guys. Uh, I'll be talking about the accessibility requirements of EV charging stations as we currently have them. So much like many of our TDLR programs, the purpose of our program and elimination of architectural barriers is specified in our law and our rules. It states that we're, uh, we are to ensure accessibility uh, to buildings and functionality for users, uh, meaning that our program is one uh, that requires um, that all people and all persons of types have the ability to use and get into uh, these facilities the same as everyone else. Now, when you think about accessibility, most people refer to the ADA. My mom, 15 years, I've been working here for 15 years, and she still says Marcia does ADA. Um, or the Americans with Disabilities Act. So what I really do is the state of Texas, it's the Texas Accessibility Standards, it's what we regulate. Now both arms, the state and the federal um, arms of government apply to the same types of facilities, but the federal accessibility guidelines are looking more to ensure the building or elements and are functional for uh, the user as opposed to the Texas Accessibility Standards. Those apply to the construction projects themselves. So we're a little bit more proactive. Um, Keep going that Texas is better, right? Um, Texas has a set of checks throughout our construction projects. We require that projects be registered with TDLR, as well as have a plan review prior to completion of construction and an inspection after construction is done to make sure it is completely accessible for everyone. Um, for the enforcement of those requirements, TDLR will hear complaints from anyone. Um, I can file a complaint on my mom's behalf or a ramp to a theater, as opposed to the uh, federal requirements, those are a civil rights law. So you have to prove that you are being discriminated against um, in order to file a complaint with them. And they wait until the project's completely done. So um, now that you know the general purpose of the elimination of architectural barriers uh, program, let me explain how we apply it to the electrical vehicle charging stations. So you'll find out that our law and our rules um, list out several different types of facilities or buildings that are subject to our standards. Um, the most common one that most people think of uh, would be called what we call public accommodation. So these are facilities that most users um, can access and they affect commerce, right? Such as hotels, um, restaurants, places of entertainment or things like that. So if any of these types of facilities provide an electrical vehicle charging station, say your theater, great place to provide electrical vehicle charging stations, right? Um, those would be subject to accessibility requirements when they're constructed. 
So for example, we have a new gas station that's being constructed um, and they're providing electrical vehicle charging stations as well. Because the facility is considered a service, um, it's listed in our rules as a service and our rules specify that those are subject uh, to compliance with the Texas Accessibility Standards. Now, I wanna point out, because uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times, that when it comes to accessibility in our program, uh, we do not consider the electrical vehicle charging stations as parking. They are actually, um, we consider them motor fuel dispensers and therefore a minimum of one of each type of cluster has to be accessible. Uh, parts within need to be within reach range for someone who's in a wheelchair or shorter in stature. Um, and they provide sufficient space at the dispenser for people to maneuver. Think of someone um, using a walker trying to fill their vehicle with a charge. Now, back in July of 23, the Access Board or the uh, feds <laughs> issued recommendations on electrical vehicle charging stations accessibility wise. Um, while these are just recommendations, TDLR is even taking those and those ideas and we're trying to implement them into an update into our Texas accessibility standards. And so you can find that on the website, you just kind of Google Access Board EV charging stations pops right up. Um, Right here, we have a rough image of what would be expected as an accessible vehicle charging station, what it looks like in our new standards. You can see the access aisles next to, on both sides of the parking, or, sorry, charging space. Um, so it depends, because a lot of the different vehicles have their, their charging point on the vehicle at several different spaces. So we're going to put access aisles on both. You're going to have to have the clear floor space so that someone in that walker can use it, and it's all going to be within reach range, things like that. Um, if you have any other questions on accessibility for those EV charging stations, I'd be happy to answer them. This is uh, Justin, a virtual question. Go ahead, Justin. So, um, great presentation. I really appreciate the proactive um, approach to this that uh, Texas um, is taking with having this built in from uh, the construction uh, standpoint. That's wonderful. I <laughs> wish more states were uh, following uh, your lead. Um, that said, you know, we are expecting to see some draft rules from the Department of Justice, from the Access Board um, very soon. <laughs> I've been expecting them for a while. Um, is how once those draft rules are kind of go through their process, I guess my question is, is, is TDLR getting or is the agency getting a little ahead and starting to draft its own rules uh, before the federal government's? And I know that you don't have to be the same, but consistency bet between the two will certainly help developers of, of charging stations. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about it in general so that Mark doesn't get upset and we stay on track with EV charging stations. <laughs> um, but in general, the idea is that um, because the el elimination of architectural barriers is a little bit special in that we create our own standards, those aren't actually in the rules themselves um, for the accessibility regulation part. We have it in the rules that it says you have to follow those standards. Um, as a general idea, if there are changes to those requirements or those standards coming down the line that we like, and we can add it to a section in our rules like y'all can um, as a rule adoption later on. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Anyone else with any questions or comments from Marcia? All right. We'll turn it over to Mr. Tim Foskey. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Foskey. I am the program supervisor for the Motor Fuel Metered and Qual Quality uh, Program here at TDLR, also known as FMQ. Uh, I've been with TDLR for about four years, but I did move over with the Ways of Measures program and where I was uh, working there for about 22 years. So I know a little something about fuel pumps. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm here to help answer any questions regarding motor fuels uh, as it may relate to electrical uh, vehicle fueling systems. Um, elect, uh, FMQ and uh, the electrical vehicle uh, fueling systems are weights and measures programs. Uh, what is the goal of a weights and measures program? Uh, weights and measures uh, program ensures that wherever you go in the state of Texas or throughout the, the uh, United States, the trades of goods and services are fair equitable for both not only the consumer, but also for the businesses. Um, this is done through participation in the national and regional conference of weights and measures. 
officers. Um, we have two of those. One is the NCWM, which is the National Conference on Weights and Measures. And then there's the uh, Southern Weights and Measures Association, known as the SWMA. Um, Motor Fuels here at TDLR has adopted handbook, NIST Handbook 44. Uh, and uh, NIST Handbook 44 also has a section in it related to electric vehicle fueling systems, which is section 3.40. Um, so you asked yourself, well, what is NIST Handbook 44? Uh, NIST stands for uh, National, Institute of, National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Uh, Handbook 44 is a national publication that sets forth specifications, tolerances, technological and safety requirements for all devices involved in weighing or measuring commodities or goods for commerce. The content of the uh, NIST Handbook 44 are reviewed and adjusted yearly by the uh, members of the National Conference on Weights and Measures, in sub NCWM, excuse me. Um, and actually we have two of our uh, uh, program specialists that are attending uh, the uh, National Conference on Weights and Measures in New Orleans as we speak. That's being held this week. So next week they will uh, return and uh, bring us back any um, changes or updates that have been made to the, uh, the handbooks as well. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, we have been going for a little bit more than an hour. So right now I'm gonna propose before we get into Mark's presentation on the meat of the statutes that we take a 10 minute break. That's okay, Alan? Perfect, thank you. Okay. We'll take a 10 minute break and it's 11.32. So we'll come back at 11.42.
everybody in the room to come back and join us as well. Are we good to pick back up, Marta? We are. All right. We're going to move on to um, item D. And a quick note before we do, I made a, I made a mistake um, in originally uh, crafting this agenda. There are three bills that passed this past session. Two of them are very integral to our work. And another one is tangentially related. Um, our, our fellow agency um, folks at the Public Utility Commission will be much more involved in that other one. But there's a bill that's not listed. It's Senate Bill 1732. Um, it relates very closely to Senate Bill 1001 because they're both in Chapter 2311 of the Occupations Code, which is the new chapter um, that creates the regulation here at TDLR of the electric vehicle charging stations. So Mark is going to give us an overview of those three bills right now, um, highlighting, of course, 1001 and 1732. Um, and again, back to our purpose. These bills specifically state that our commission must adopt these rules by December 1st of this year. And that's what we're all here um, to begin the drafting process of and, and the discussion of. And then, as Mark said, um, it will then follow the traditional tr rulemaking process of, of TDLR and every other state agency. And anyone from the public, um, whether you're part of this work group or not, whether you have an electric vehicle or not, whether uh, anyone from the public will be invited to submit comment. There'll be a 30-day comment period in the Texas Register. The rules will be adopted by our commission at a public meeting where they'll take comments. So, again, transparency is our guide. Um, and, Mark, I'll stop talking and turn it over to you um, to give an overview of, uh, of the bills. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, for the record, Mark Gladney, Assistant General Counsel uh, for the EV program. Uh, as uh, um, Presiding Officer Bruno had, had stated, uh, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the bills in question, again, mainly SB 1001 and, and 1732. Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna devalue uh, SB 1000, uh, actually uh, 1732, sorry. So we'll be talking about SB uh, 1001 and 1732. Now I'm not gonna devalue uh, SB 1002. It's an extremely important bill, but you know, again, as uh, uh, presiding officer uh, Bruno has stated, you know, we're kind of going to leave that a little bit more to our friends over at uh, Texas and, and PUC um, uh, and leave uh, those issues to their cable staffs uh, on that. We're, we're going to just kind of focus more in on 1001 and 1732. So um, when we talk about those two bills, uh, 1001 and 1732, uh, I found when I started to review those, those bills, uh, there's a lot of areas uh, that uh, are, are kind of left um, um, sort of more in general terms. And as I talked about in my, my previous uh, presentation on the APA, uh, rules are, are meant to explain or, or interpret uh, the, the legislative uh, um, kind of intent of, of a, a statute that uh, it's, it's uh, explaining. So this means that we basically are going to have a, a lot of leeway uh, to create rules, as long as they're rationally related to what the statute says, uh, we're going to have a, a, a lot of uh, flexibility, uh, I would say, in, in creating those rules to explain those particular uh, statutes that need explaining. You know, again, some of these uh, statutes that, that you're finding in 1001 and 1732 are pretty straightforward. But there's uh, a number of them where it's just simply saying, hey, the department, by rule, may or must create uh, a, a rule or rules to explain basically, you know, the objective that's in the, um, in the, uh, um, the actual bill. So um, that's what uh, the purpose of this work group is going to be. You know? So uh, in keeping with SB 1001, I'm going to kind of go through where, uh, the areas in which we will be setting rules. And this isn't going to be exhaustive because SB 1001, even though it's a pretty short bill, um, it, it, it really uh, packs in a lot of stuff. Um, so we're going to be basically, this work group is going to be setting rules related to program fees, 
And uh, under Chapter 55 uh, of the Occupation Code for uh, TDLR, um, we have the authority to set uh, program fees for, for each program that we have um, in, in an amount that it allows the, the agency to actually run the program. You know, so that's kind of something that, you know, we're going to be doing probably more internally with, with staff than we would be with the work group because uh, obviously, you know, staff is a little bit more familiar or a lot more familiar with uh, the internal operations of, of the, um, the agency and how much it actually costs and what should be set aside to run the program effectively. So that's, a, that's not necessarily something that the committees are going to really sink their teeth into. That's probably going to be more you know, related to the department staff personnel. Uh, other rules we'll be setting will be um, electric vehicle supply uh, equipment inspection processes. And I think that was briefly kind of discussed. Uh, and we're later going to determine whether department staff would be conducting those inspections or will it be contracted out to a third party, which uh, SB 1001 gives the, uh, the agency the, the, uh, the authority to go and, and possibly seek out a third party contractor to, uh, um, to do the inspections. You know? And we're certainly gonna be, that's one of the questions I think that I had, and I think a lot of staff members have as well, is uh, you know, picking your brains to determine you know, who's out there that's capable of being able to do the inspections of the EBSE. You know? Uh, units, you know, so uh, that's that's probably something that's going to be uh, discussed quite a bit in, in uh, one or both committees. So, very very important um, uh, aspect because um, I believe we already had a discussion about uh, um, th there, there's already some existing units in, in places that you know, may be broken or you know not operable and all that, and the inspections are going to be important you know, so that we know. You know where those those uh, particular units are, and um, and and how they need to be fixed, and on what schedule. You know. um, we're also going to be writing rules relating to consumer uh, complaint processing and disposition, um, the various exemptions for EBSE uh, under um, uh, Chapter Twenty Three Eleven. What are the specific duties of the uh, the EV supply provider? Um, the uh, uh, SB 1001 talks about it, you know, but, um, you know, there, there may be some more explanation that's going to have to be done um, in, in terms of writing some rules and to delineate what, what those duties are going to, going to be. Uh, other rules that are going to be written uh, are going to be related to registration procedures uh, for charging units. The specifications and tolerances for EBSEs, and we, you know, we briefly discussed that. Um, you know, the, uh, the bill SB 1001 obviously says that the NISA standards, uh, the specifications and tolerances that uh, NISA set up, those are going to be in our rules, okay? We're going to adopt those, those particular standards by reference into our rules. But as you've heard um, from the uh, other departments that have uh, come up here, uh, we're also going to have to consider other aspects, whether it's... Uh, uh, architectural barriers or um, um, the, the, uh, um, issues related to the um, code for electricians, the 1305 and the occupations code. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, areas that we're going to have to be concerned about. And what are we going to adopt by reference in our rules uh, to make it uh, um, you know, a lot more efficient for us to to regulate these uh, these units. So, uh, I've noticed that in FMQ, in their provision relating to adoption by reference, there's probably anywhere between ten or twelve different um, you know specification and tolerance standards that they've adopted. We're probably going to be somewhere around there too. Uh, and uh, I think a, a, a member had already uh, suggested that uh, the feds are, are continuing to work on new rules and regulations that are associated with uh, EBSE. And how's that going to dovetail with what it is that we're doing? Because we're working on a different time schedule than, than the federal government is. And you know, everybody knows how, how fast or how slow Congress moves. Odds are we're gonna be probably moving a lot faster than they are. 
Uh, and what effect is any adopted rules that we come up with, what's the effect going to be if we adopt rules that later on down the line, the, the federal government comes and adopts something different that may conflict with what we've done. So, you know, that again goes along with the, what I've said before, is that these rules are going to be basically living, breathing, and kind of organisms that are going to be subject to change um, based on how effective uh, our ultimate adopted rules are going to be, and then what outside um, organizations and obviously what the federal government's going to do. So there's going to be changes now, even after adoption. So everybody needs to be ready for that and, um, and be aware of it. Other rules that we're going to, to have to adopt uh, are rules that direct operate operators when to remove and repair damaged equipment. And then, of course, um, enforcement processes and procedures. So there's going to have to be rules uh, associated with that. Yeah. So there's lots to do, obviously, and we have a very short window in which to do them in, as I talked about before. We're probably looking at anywhere between five, six months tops to have um, uh, rules proposed that have to go to the governor's office for approval. We're not entirely sure how long it would take the governor's office to do it. So um, October 10th is the commission meeting that we're looking uh, to get these adopted by. Uh, I'm really hoping we can go that, uh, we can hit that. So um, again, lots of work to do. Now, um, I briefly mentioned that there's some other deadlines that you know came up in SB uh, 1001. You know, we have some other deadlines that are set up by the bills that we can't forget about, you know, such as uh, providers registering, uh, operating non-exempt uh, EVSEs by March 1st, 2025. Um, non-exempt uh, EVSEs must be operating in compliance with manufacturer specs in Chapter 2311 um, and our rules by March uh, 1st, 2025, if installed after September 1st of 23 and before March 1st, 25. Uh, also, some of those non-exempt e uh, EBSCs must be uh, operating in compliance uh, by um, March 1st, 2028, if they're installed after uh, on March 1st, 2025. Uh, EBSCs installed after December 1st of 2024 uh, that are made available to the public and not primarily in intended for public use and, and funded by public private grants or a rebate program not uh, required to uh, not required to comply with NIST standards or tolerances uh, until January 1st of 2030. Um, and in general, non-exempt uh, EVSEs must be operated in compliance with Chapter 2311 by January 1st of 2030. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all this stuff is still going to be, you know, we're going to be working on this stuff for, for quite some time, you know. Whether it's with this particular work group or or uh, inside the department, but um, you know we've got we've got a lot of work to do, and it's going to be spread out, uh, not just um, you know to December first of twenty twenty four, but all the way to twenty thirty and probably beyond. Yeah. So um, you know, as I said, um, in keeping with these two bills, we have an adoption deadline December first of twenty twenty four, and. Um, you know, we, we, as we said, we got a lot of work to do. So um, SB 1732 is, is dealing with the EVSC charging standards. Um, and that's been pretty much uh, in the news quite a bit as it appears that the, uh, the NC, uh, NACS uh, plug is gonna be the standard plug that's, that's going to happen. And I think uh, I, I read that uh, it's looking like it's gonna start happening uh, as early as 2025. You know? So um, I know that uh, a lot of manufacturers are going to adopt that standard. There's some manufacturers that are a little bit slow. Speaking for myself, I have a VW ID4. VW was pretty slow, uh, but they, they finally uh, decided that they're, they're going to go that way as well. So anybody who's got a, a uh, electric vehicle from that company uh, and some of its subsidiaries, going to have to get an adapter plug in order to um, to, to uh, comply with the NACS standard. Uh, you know, later models will, will actually obviously have that as well other manufacturers. So um, that's 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 a big deal. And they finally decided on a uh, 
a, a standard plug. So um, that's pretty much all I've got. We're, we're not going to go down and deep into SB 1001 and 1732 today. Now we're going to leave that to the committees. That's when we're going to really get down deep into uh, you know what these these bills mean and, and how we're going to deal with them. Just wanted to give you just sort of a brief over, overview of, of what these two bills are talking about. So um, that's all I've got. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I'll do my best to answer them now. Anyone online or in the room have any comments or, or questions for Mark about those? I do. This is Denise Coastrelli. Um I was wondering, are we going to get a copy of the 1732? I didn't yes, get a copy of it. We'll make sure that gets sent out um, after the meeting. I apologize for that. We'll get those sent okay. out to all the worker members. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, and this is Mark. You know, we, we can also provide you with hyperlinks to those bills as well. Um, you know, so you, you'll you'll have them, you know, at your, at your convenience, and you can just go look at them. Can I ask you to do that? Okay. Um, yep, I'll do it first thing after the meeting. Thank, thank you. you so right, thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Mark. Um, we're going to briefly before we get into item F, which is the division of work, we wanted to um, talk about the work group member roles and responsibilities and and the anatomy of a meeting, um, it's gonna look a lot like this meeting. What's gonna happen um, at our next agenda item is that we will actually divide this work group into um, sub work groups, I guess is the proper term. To committees. To com into committees, thank you, Mark. Ah, I should read the agenda, to committees. <laughs> oh, and, and what's gonna happen is um, after we do that, Anna will be our coordinator for scheduling. Um, and Mark will be leading those two groups. I'll be a part of both of them with him. Um, and those two groups are really going to begin um, working on on putting putting words to paper, um, right, Mark, to around those topics that he outlined um, for these proposed rules. Um, is there anything, Anna, that I've missed that you want to add about the anatomy of a meeting or anything anything related to that? You put me on the spot here. <laughs> Um, one thing I did want to add is about public comments. Uh, there's going to be three different ways that people can give public comments during our meetings after this one. Uh, you can either attend in person, uh, fill out a form, give it to me, and you can uh, speak to the work group, or you can email me. Uh, we do have uh, information about doing that on our agendas, on every agenda. You can either email me the full um, public comment with any attachments or anything like that that you would like, or you can email me and request to be a part of the meeting virtually, uh, and we can do it that way. But other than that, I think we're good. Thank you. Great, and that's as she noted, that will appear on the future agendas for this work group, um, so that folks, both virtually and in person, we want to make uh, provide as many opportunities as possible um, for comments. All right. Um, okay. Now we're going to get into item F. And I will predict that everyone on our work group wants to be on both committees, but that's not going to allow us to be very efficient in our work. So we are going to be dividing up. Um, we've got two work groups. We've got our registration work group. And that work group is going to review and make recommendations regarding application and registration requirements and other administrative matters relating to the eventual registration that as Mark noted, will begin in March of 2025. Then we're gonna divide up into a compliance work group. That group is gonna talk about the inspections and the standards and the compliance um, and calibration related specifically to the charging stations. So I'm gonna ask you, Anna, to, uh, I'm not sure the best way to do this. I think we'll begin by going member by member and asking each of our members to list um, a preference for where you'd like to go. We're looking for an even distribution. And again, let me remind you all members that um, the committee's work will be brought back to the full work group um, for our full work group and for the benefit of the public. So I fully recognize that I think any of our work group members could serve very well with your backgrounds and experiences on both of these. But again, 
We've got to divide up in order to get this work done in order to meet our deadline. So please keep that in mind as Anna calls on you. Um, I'll let you go in order. Of course. Um, and again, Mr. we're gonna we're gonna specify, and this is a agenda item F for group members. Um, please give your preference for either the registration um, committee or the compliance committee. Mr. Wilson. Uh, the compliance committee, please. Ms. Costarelli. I would also do the compliance if possible. Okay. Uh, Ms. Wall had to leave. Um, so you can put her on whichever one you'd like. Okay. Uh, Ms. Deagle. Also compliance committee. I think we have a trend here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, can you hear us? He is logged in, but his camera is off and his mic is off. So I'm not sure if he is hearing us. Uh, Mr. Moran. Um, despite the presiding officer's recommendation, <laughs> I think this is a, you know, as it's been described, a living organism. And to work on, you know, just building the feet and the hands really needs to see part of it. So I, I would volunteer to participate on both. Oh, cool. Well, we'll assign you to one. <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Robert Pitzel. Mr. Pitzel, can you hear me? Looks like you're muted. Okay, we'll uh, move on. Uh, Mr. Donahue also had to leave the meeting. Uh, Tyler Nicholson. Uh, registration. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Michael Chamberlain. Compliance, please. Jamie Mitchell. Uh, compliance, please. <laughs> Mike Wisco. <laughs> Let's go with compliance. <laughs> okay. Two, three, four, five. We have six people who would like to be on compliance. Hey, Anna. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, Wisco? finally. I'm sorry. I'm having some technical difficulties over here. But uh, I would gladly do registration, and Inflex One can do whatever y'all need. Perfect. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Bruno, would you like to be on both of these since you're on staff as well? Um, I think I'm going to have to. Oh, yes. Yes. You can mute your mic or your speakers. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. So we have 13 members besides you, Mr. Bruno. So we can put six on one and seven on the other. If that's what you prefer. Um, okay, let's do that. So it looks like everybody who wanted to be on the compliance committee are on the compliance committee. Uh, Mr. Moran, did you want to be compliance? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have for compliance, I have Wilson, Costarelli, Stiegel, Moran, uh, Chamberlain, Mitchell, and Wisco. And then, and Mr. Bruno. And then for the registration work group, I have Wall, Johnson, Tynert, Donahue, and Nicholson. Does that sound right to everybody? Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. That was that was a lot quicker than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I appreciate it. And again, let me let me remind everyone, um, regardless of which committee you're going to be on. The full group will be discussing both committee's reports. We'll also be hearing from members of the public um, and any other interested parties as these develop. Um, I'll also remind you of an, a very important thing that Mr. Gladney talked about. This bill lays out several different years of markers coming ahead of us. We're, we're at the very beginning. We're laying the foundation. And this will be an evolving document. Um, I'm going to guess based on my experience with technology, that as we sit here at the beginning of 2024, by the time we get to 2026 and 2027 and 2028, things are gonna look a little different. Um, and the beauty of our rules document is that it's able to evolve with that. Um, of course, there may be 
uh, necessity or, or desire for legislative changes, that is only gonna, that opportunity is only available to us every two years here in Texas. Um, the rules are a living, breathing document that um, can be adjusted a little bit more nimbly, but of course, always done in compliance um, and within the four corners of what the statute lays out. By 2030, we might have flying cars. So. <laughs> that, that'd be a different work group. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> They'll be flying electric cars. We, we certainly could be there. Who knows what we'll see. Um, I have an eight-year-old, so by the time he has a driver's license, I'm frightened as to what his options are going to be. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I will now... Um, any closing comments? Um, I don't have any. Um, I don't believe Mr. Francis does either. <laughs> Do any work group members have any closing comments before we adjourn this first meeting? All right. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Guess, oh, oh, Mr. Wilson, please. And I apologize if I, I missed it. I had an incoming call. Um, was there discussion of the date, time, and location of the next meeting of this group? Um, that will be determined on the schedule that uh, Mark and Anna are going to be working on with the committees. Um, so at this time, we don't have one, although we are operating within that general framework that Mr. Gladney laid out um, with October as our ultimate goal. Um, so I envision at least two or three uh, more uh, meetings of this full group, at which time we'll have reports being offered by our committees. We'll hear from public comment and continue to evolve and and draft this, uh, prepare this initial draft of rules. Again, um, it, it's worth repeating for the sake of transparency that will eventually be published in the Texas Register, like all rules by all state agencies and by TDLR, available for a 30-day comment. Um, the commission meeting, when the Commission of Licensing and Regulation meets to adopt these, again, an opportunity for public comment. So. Plenty of chances for folks to weigh in um, and provide their input on this very important uh, task that we're all sharing. Uh, this is Mark Lightning for the record. Um, I, I can only say that, you know, as far as future committee meetings are going to be concerned, um, you know, the next ones are probably going to be pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, as I said, I need to get with Anna and, and, and you know, and board support will be polling uh, the, the various members of the committees to see what dates work out for them. Uh, I expect that each committee meeting is probably going to be somewhere between four and six hours long, so you guys better pack a lunch. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark, for that. <laughs> All right. Um, that concludes today's agenda. And at uh, 1214 on the 9th, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.